Austin with Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department. Uh, welcome to this month's Hump Day Hangout. We're going to continue with our discussion of high-rise fire operations. Uh, I don't think there's anybody on the, in the fire service that didn't notice the spectacular fire in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates on New Year's Eve. And uh, we've got a distinguished guest with us today that has uh, vast experience with um, uh, international fire protection. Uh, it's Jack Murphy. I'm going to have him introduce himself, but uh, as we will every month, we uh, will go, everybody will introduce themselves, and uh, then we'll continue our discussion. Uh, if I can just, uh, uh, just some housekeeping from last month. Um, first of all, let's uh, thank Keyhose, that's keyfire.com, for sponsoring this hump day hangout. Uh, when we're talking high rise fire operations, you're talking about operating in a, in a fairly confined space in uh, narrow hallways and narrow stairways. There's a compelling need for hose that resists, resists kinking, especially at lower pressures, which may be problematic operating with standpipes. I can't think of a hose that would be better suited for high-rise high firefighting operations than Key, especially their top of the line, the Key Combat Ready Hose. So a big shout out and thank you for Key for sponsoring this. Uh, last month, uh, we were discussing uh, the use of elevators, and I heard from a, a friend of mine, Al Holsenbeck, who is a, a retired chief out of Wilmington, Delaware. Oh, by the way, they had a heck of a, a fire in a row house there I saw on the news, I think it was yesterday. He brought up a couple of points uh, about uh, elevator use. Uh, one is, uh, and we may not have uh, touched on it as much as we should have, is that uh, when a company gets in an elevator, they need to familiarize themselves with the closest stairwell. Now, you may not be able to do that on the first floor because the first floor may be laid out differently. Uh, in South Florida, that is definitely the case because our stairwells discharge primarily to the outside. So we would have to go to the second floor or on our first precautionary stop and familiarize ourselves with where the closest stairway is. Additionally, he had an excellent idea. If you are the RIC team, the RIC company, Rapid Intervention Company, you make sure that you are equipped with the proper elevator hoistway keys. And I can expand on that. I would actually go and find an elevator that's not being used to transport firefighters and practice with the key and also familiarize yourself with how to circumvent the uh, door restrictor, the mechanical door restrictor, so that you could do it in limited visibility if you had to rescue uh, occupants, uh, either firefighters or civilians. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Chief Al, for that, uh, that input. Uh, we do listen to you. And uh, we learn. We all learn from each other. So I, I wanted to bring that up. Uh, so let's let's begin with our our, uh, our distinguished guest, Jack Murphy. Jack, if you would, if you could tell a little bit about yourself, and uh, then we'll continue with the the introduction. So go ahead, Jack, and welcome welcome to the Hump Day Hangout. Thank you, guys. Yeah, first of all, contributing editor with Fire Engineering probably for about 25 years, and work with the FDIC as as Bob Holtons, as they call me, the handler. Any place Bob goes, I'm the shadow. Uh, FDIC, uh, been there for 20 years, uh, teach at the college, John Jay, it's fire science programs, former fire marshal and deputy chief. With the high rise in New York City, the fire safety directors, we're strong in New York City since 1978, and I'm the chairman of that group now. And I sit on the three NFPA committees. First, soon after 9-11, we formed the NFPA high rise uh, fire safety advisory committee, where we push everything down to the technical committees uh, for uh, their review and everything. 1620 pre-planning and out of all the 9-11 stuff we found if I went, I went across the country it's such a variety. Some people have fire safety directors, some have life safety, some have coordinators. So for the gentlemen out there in all the high-rise buildings the NFPA is forming a new standard committee to look at fire safety directors in high-rise buildings and any occupancy with 500 or more. So this is a big thing that's, that's developing right now. It's going to help all of you out. And we're also looking at residentials, too, somebody there who can direct you around. So this is a good thing, and uh, it's a positive thing. Jack where, did, Jack, where did you get your experience with international fire safety? Well, I, I spent four years at Citigroup, uh, Citicorp, internationally. Uh, in the, we were in 103 countries, had over 300,000 employees. Uh, Citigroup got into this uh, thing after the uh, San Paulo fire. We lost 170 some odd employees down there in the, in the late 70s, and when I went across the, around the world globally, 
I, I always looked at either the countries I went into, they have American standards or British standards. And with that, I can apply that. But basically, I applied NFPA globally because there was no I codes at the time. And that worked out well. In some countries where I had what I call water problems, or I'll give you an example, an open high rise, 20 story, a high rise, 20 stories, one staircase open, no sprinklers, not too much water. Based on that, if they couldn't give us sprinklers in the building, they couldn't go above the third floor. So you wouldn't allow your employees, Citigroup employees, to go above the third floor in these buildings? In, in those countries that couldn't supply enough water. Yes. I want to give a shout out to uh, our, our brothers and sisters uh, that are not in the United States or Canada. Uh, we have viewers from uh, that I hear from. Uh, I got a brother that has contacted me a couple times from Israel and uh, Australia. So I think that, uh, you know, we've got people all over the world watching. And uh, I want to welcome our international uh, brothers and sisters to, uh, to the, to the hump, hang, hump Day hang, up as, hang, up, hang Out as well. Excuse me. Um, Mike Dugan, would you introduce yourself, sir? Good afternoon, uh, brothers and sisters. My name is Mike Dugan. I'm a retired captain from the FDNY. I did 27 years in the FDNY and retired as a captain a lot of 1, 2, 3. And I'm glad to be here with you talking about some of this stuff. I now work part-time in the city of New York uh, teaching fire safety directors and reviewing buildings, high-end buildings in the city of New York. And Jack and I see some of the same stuff and it's amazing what's going on out there. There are buildings being built all over the, the, the world that these high-rises do not take the fire safety aspect into full account. And as everybody saw, as we said, in Dubai on New Year's Eve, um, the interior systems worked well. It was the exterior system there. There are other places that have great systems but don't have people who know how to uh, man these things or run the alarm panels or things like that. And as Jack was talking about, um, the NFPA is looking at it in the United States of America, where if you have this high-rise building, you're going to have to have certified people in there. So this is going to be a great talk with a lot of information. Very good. Very good, Mike. Thanks for being here. Jason Hovelman from America's Heartland, outside of St. Louis, Missouri. Jason, if you could introduce yourself. Sure thing. Thanks, Bill. I'm Jason Holman. I'm a career battalion chief uh, with the Flores and Valley Fire Protection District and co-owner and lead instructor with Engine House Training. And uh, happy to be here. Looking forward to another great conversation. Very good. Daryl Liggins from Oakland, California, sir. How are you guys doing? Um, my name is Daryl Liggins. I'm with Oakland. I've been there for since 99 in the fire service for 23 years. I'm a captain. Uh, at an engine company. Um, I'm not currently in a high-rise district. I'm working out at East Oakland uh, near the Oakland Coliseum, home of the Golden State Warriors. <laughs> Probably been beating all of your teams out there this year. Um, I am an adjunct instructor at many different conferences and with uh, working under Dave McGrail for Standpipe and high rise operations at FDIC for several years, and I'm here to learn from you guys today. And Clark Lamping, or I'm sorry, Dan Shaw, sir. Hey, thanks, Bill. Uh, Dan Shaw, I'm a battalion chief with Fairfax County Fire and Rescue, uh, also one of the uh, vice presidents of Traditions Training, and uh, co author of 25 to Survive. And uh, looking forward to another great conversation. And uh, Jason, I'm sorry to hear about your Rams. and Daryl, I didn't realize the NBA was still around. <laughs> <laughs> right, so College basketball, baby. College basketball. <laughs> now, Clark Lamping uh, from the Las Vegas area. Yes, uh, sir. Clark Lamping, yourself. captain, station yes, 11 on Las Vegas Boulevard. I've been uh, captain for about six years now. I've uh, been on the job for 18 years. Out of those 18 years, I've spent 14 years working on Las Vegas Boulevard, where we have some of the largest high-rise hotels in the world, rows and rows of them, multiple billion-dollar buildings that are in my first due. So I've got a bit of experience at this topic, and I'd be happy to share it with you if you want to hear it. Uh, Jack, I'm going to begin with you. Um, and I, 
I'm sure a lot of our, our, our participants that are watching are thinking the same thing. Okay, there was this big fire in Dubai. Why does that pertain to me in the United States, say in St. Louis, Missouri, or Miami, Florida? In Dubai, the, the fire, again, an exterior fire, auto claving, auto exposure going off the building very rapidly is due to a ESFI, you know, the EFA stuff that's out there. That's in the United States, it's been around since the 1960s, but it's taken off quite a bit with this ESFI stuff. They, they can form different things on the building. Take like in Clark's area, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? the Caesar Palace there with the fake columns and things like that on the top of the roof. So they can do that without going into a heavy masonry type of thing. It's rated for good insulation in that. It meets the minimum, and I repeat, the minimum requirements for the International uh, Code Council and the building code. However, when they put this stuff up, there's a polyurethane foam basing in there as an insulation. Basically, some of this stuff, and, and again, this varies, but it comes in like eight layers. And in that eight layer, there's a drainage plane in there. So in other words, if there any water gets in there, it drains down. So now this is an open channel wherever that fire starts to get underneath the outer layer protecting from the outer elements and works its way behind it. So it's in between what I call the, uh, the full wall in, in, on the building, the skin wall, the curtain wall, and this layer is on the outside. So it has glue in there too. Another thing, you know, the, uh, another flammable combustible that's in there too. So you see this fire, it goes rapidly. Dubai has had two, uh, Germany has one I think, France has had another, and obviously uh, Clark County has had uh, one in the Las Vegas and that. So it's one of those things that, that's been out there and the aspect is, and, and I encourage people, and I'm saying this fully to the fire service, we need more people out there to help during the code development process. The industry beats us up, all right, and they put this out there. And, and we always, they're always asking us, well, give me the incidents in these buildings, and we do that for them, but they're not accountable for that. They say they have a test, and they pass the test. Don't get me wrong. But the idea is that once they find the problem, it still stays there. I believe in Dubai, there are several hundred of these buildings out there yet. But do they have building intelligence on it? And you know where I'm coming from with that, Bill. Do they have intelligence knowing ahead of time before they go out the door that these 300 some odd buildings have this type of uh, structure on the outside? So they can take a look at those and work that into their, into their pre-planning aspect, too. I was... Uh in my research, I was uh, reading a few articles, one by a, a fire protection engineer from uh, the UK, and he or she, I can't remember, mentioned uh, about, uh, there's an addi additional factor here, and that is the silicone and the rubber uh, seals for, for water, for, for uh, waterproofing, and that also can contribute fuel to the fire. Now, I don't want to bash this entire industry. Uh, this, the EFIS, uh, can be, depending upon what type of foam they use and the methods of construction, a perfectly safe, it can be a safe building system, provided it is designed with fire safety in mind. Would you agree, Jack? Oh, most definitely, Bill. But the idea here is that, and I just challenge the industry, that when you see these things happening, how do you change things? How do you make it better? How do you make it more fire rated on the outside? And that's where I need the industry to step up a little bit more and say, take the, take the bull by the horns. Uh, again, sometimes you need more than just the minimum stuff when you have it. You look at these fires, though, there's, there's been no death. Again, we know how that goes. That, that gets on everybody's radar screen. So from these type of things out there, there are a lot of buildings out there, even smaller buildings, two-story, one-story, four stories, have this stuff on the outside. And the problem there on the outside, too, is mulch fires. Yes, yes. You get to that outside skin, it's going up, and it goes quick. And this is completely consistent with the right. research that's been done by uh, NIST and UL. Mm -hmm. uh, when you got a fire that's spreading, originates or spreads on the exterior, you got to get that first line to the exterior. Otherwise, it's going to climb right up the side of the building, either because of uh, combustible cladding or uh, combustible balconies. Did, did anybody catch in the, in the Dubai fire the blevy? Yes. All right. Yes, I saw the explosion. Yeah, that was at the lower end. Yes, and at the lower without end. Without knowing anything, I know they don't have natural gas there. They might have had LV tanks in a, in the kitchen area for gas and things like that. But that was some blevy. Yeah. I was wondering if that was an outdoor barbecue, Jack. Could be, Mike. But you know, I know they don't have natural gas in the building. 
Now, until um, a couple of months ago, um, Clark explained to me what this EFSI or is it ESFI material was, and I didn't even realize that it is on a lot of um, uh, smaller buildings or strip malls and things. Uh, for for people out there, uh, that might have went over some people's heads. Can we explain exactly what this material is and where people may find it in their cities? Yeah. It Again, it's like an outside skin, and and I in my uh, offline thing, I said I always know what it is. And buildings that go in, I either bang on the wall or something. You hear a hollowness. It isn't that that solidified thing that you have with bricks and and solid wood. And all it is, it always looks decorative. It always looks like they have uh, the how would I say the old the old buildings where they had this Art Deco on the outside too. But they could be straight up skin though. And all it is, it's a quick and easy method of putting it up. And it could be in a multiple buildings. Just for me, I always look at stucco. That's what it looks like in the United States. Has anyone seen anything different on the outside of a material? Not like Dubai, where they put the aluminum on the outside. So that type of thing. You just again reading the building. How do you read that building? Is it a one? Is it five? <laughs> you know, in that type of classification. But the outside, you just can't tell. You have to go in and take the building apart. We had a. Uh, uh it's Bill Daly. Uh, just flashed me a, a message about uh, high-rise nozzles, and uh, I'm I'm going to gather he's referring to the below, below the fire floor nozzle, the use of nozzles uh, that we would use in a wind-driven fire situation. But we also have to consider the use of uh, uh, nozzles for fighting uh, the exterior spread of fire. Uh, Clark, could you tell us? Uh, a little bit about the Monte Carlo fire where you had to improvise with portable master stream devices to fight a fire that was climbing the exterior of the building. Absolutely. The Monte Carlo fire was in January of 2008 and it was started on the roof of the building. Um, they had some workers up there using a cutting torch and they got some slag on this EI, EFIS system and that started burning the foam. It went to the back of the parapet. It climbed up the back of the parapet down the front of the parapet traveling inside the foam and burning and then it started traveling laterally across the front of the Monte Carlo Hotel. Well this stuff breaks down and it melts and it comes off just like napalm on fire and anything it touches it sticks to and starts burning. <clears throat> on the 29th floor they had another one of these a ledge that was made of this same system and it was decorative. It was about a 16 inch ledge that created a little border and we had fire drop down and sit on that ledge and start burning that ledge. So eventually what we had was about 20 rooms on fire on six different floors of this building. Uh, we had suites on the 32nd floor. We had about seven or eight suites on the 32nd floor on fire. We had multiple floors on the 29th, multiple rooms on the 29th floor on fire. We had uh, fire dropping down onto the roof of the valet parking on the roof of the valet parking and then that started that roof on fire and then uh, breached the window on the first floor so we had multiple multiple rooms on fire as well out of the reach 29th floor well out of the reach of our streams so we had crews go interior open up a door fight the room fire knock all the fire all the way out to the window and then have to lean out of the window with two and a half lines with smooth bore nozzles and knock out all the fire they could reach on the exterior now we had one crew showed up, Station 25, they showed up and they had one of these rapid attack monitors, quick attack monitors, and they actually utilized that inside of a hotel room. They put the monitor outside of the window and because of the configuration of the hotel there were three wings, it would kind of be like a Y-shaped building. They were on one wing of this hotel with this rapid attack monitor hooked up to one two and a half on a, on a they had a fog nozzle set on a straight stream. They managed to knock the fire from one wing all the way across the hotel to another wing and knock the majority of the exterior fire down with this one rapid attack monitor. Jason Ovalman, any thoughts, any reflections on uh, this type of construction? Yeah, we've been seeing it a lot in, like uh, Jack had mentioned, in the smaller buildings, hotels. Uh, we had one hotel remodel the exterior and they used a lot of that on the exterior walls and the, the, the corners and edges. But additionally, this fall, my son's high school, the original building is the large stone panels. They're, they're real stone. 
um, and uh, the whole building is like that. Well, they just built a new multi-purpose gymnasium type building next to it, and it looks like the old building, but it's all that sprayed on material. And what, what was interesting is we were there uh, one day while they were actually applying some of that. And that stuff flies everywhere. And what it looks like are the small little pellets uh, when it's coming off that, like you'd find in a bean, ba uh, bean bag or something like that. And it just it's everywhere. But it looks exactly like the building next to it. All right, uh, Clark, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, we, we had discussed, um, not on the air, but uh, you and I personally, about um, when you get a cornice, uh, and a fire is running this cornice uh, or a, a mansard that overhangs, say, the front of a, a of a strip shopping center, and how your department deals with that. Uh, yes, first of all, we we see a lot of this stuff not just at the big hotels, but we see an enormous amount of this stuff on concrete tilt-up buildings. You know, a traditional concrete tilt-up building, it looks pretty plain. So a lot of time, these design and building designers and construction companies, on the very top edge, they're going to put uh, a decorative edge and just glue it onto the side of this building. They glue a 4x4 four four channel onto the side of the building, also made of styrofoam, and then the decorative the decorative piece has a 4x4 four four channel cut into it. And they fill that with glue and they simply glue this mansard on the edge of the on the top edge of the building. If you do not know it's there, it is extremely dangerous for truck companies if you're going to go to the roof and you put a ground ladder or an aerial on top of the edge of the building, you better know what you're standing on because if you have a 250 pound fireman puts his foot on this stuff, it's going to break right off and he's going to fall down. So if you don't think you have this in your jurisdiction, I'm willing to bet you that you do and you don't even know it. A lot of fast food restaurants are using this, a lot of strip malls are using this, Light commercials using this, Lowe's, Home Depots are using this kind of stuff. So I'm willing to bet you that you do have these systems inside your first in. And if you don't know, if you don't realize what you have and what you're looking at, and you stand on this stuff, you are in very grave danger. So with that in mind, as a truck company captain, when we're pulling up to any kind of a commercial building, this is the first thing I'm looking at. I'm looking at the top edge of that building to see if I can identify if we have this foam, decorative foam on that building. And for this reason, primarily, when we show up on a scene, the truck company always tries to take the Charlie side. Very rarely are you going to find this decorative system on the Charlie side. Uh, again, this is not structural whatsoever. It is strictly for aesthetic purposes. On the Charlie side, you're going to have your loading docks. You're going to have your employee entrance, employee parking. You're not going to find this stuff on the Charlie side. So we try to go to the Charlie side with our truck companies, and that's where we access the roof because we know we can safely <clears throat> get on that roof. Okay, what about the chainsaw? I thought that was interesting. Yes, absolutely. If we do find ourselves in a situation that we cannot access this roof without getting on the foam, one person goes up very carefully, we ladder this building, goes up very carefully, tries to step on the load-bearing wall, tries to step on the actual structure and not the foam, and when we go to the roof, obviously we have chainsaws. This stuff is very lightweight, easy to get through. So that first firefighter on the roof, he fires up that chainsaw and he cuts all the way through this material. Cuts it one side, cuts it the other side, creates about a two or three foot channel and then strikes it with a tool and knocks that piece right off the side of the building. At that point, the man who's butting the ladder, he can roll the ground ladder right into that channel. So now the tip of the ground ladder is on the structural member. It's actually on the concrete. And additionally, we've created a cradle for that ladder to sit in. So it's even more structurally sound of the tip. It's not going to go right or left, and it's not going to go back. So from that, it, that whole operation, if you train on it, that whole operation should take you about 15 seconds. And it's much, much safer than trying to stand on this building. All right, let me pose this question to everybody. Uh, I, I wrote these down in advance, obviously. Say smoke on the fire floor requires firefighters to advance a hose line. This is in a high-rise building. Now. To advance a hose line from the refuge of an enclosed stairwell. Now, when you do this, this is going to allow smoke to enter the stairwell, which in effect turns it into a chimney. How does your department deal with occupants using the stairwell for evacuation? And does it permit or require ventilating the top of the stairway 
roof bulkhead. Now let's keep in mind some of the recent uh, research by NIST, UL, and FDNY on ventilating roof bulkheads uh, when they're advancing hose lines. So, uh, in fact, Mike Dugan, would you like to uh, weigh in on this? Absolutely. I mean, uh, again, depending on the type of the building and everything else, we've determined that one of our mainstream tactics used to be in the FDNY books, nothing will deter the roof man from getting the roof. Well, now, especially in high-rise buildings, we don't do it. Because if you, even if you go back to uh, articles and Jack will know this guy, Chief Chapman, Elmer Chapman from the 60s and 70s about the neutral pressure plane where the, depending on the exterior temperature, the interior temperature, there are always physics, we can't change physics, there always is going to be an area where this moves and what is going to happen for us is there's going to be a change, there's going to be a change in a fire flow path by us opening up something else. We have to determine where our people are in that flow path and can we, by opening up these bulkheads, opening up the roof or whatever else, can we control that flow pad if we need to? If not, then you better think about what you're doing. And again, it's common sense. We don't want to put our people at risk. In the New York City high-rise buildings, we have the, um, the fan systems, the purge fans for the, ch the chiefs. Well, it's supposed to be a fire department key that only the fire department has. The chief gives it to someone and says, okay, purge the, thir the 13th floor, the 14th floor, the 200th floor, I don't know, the 100th floor, whatever. But the chief gives the order and allows that to be done when he has communicated to all of his people. We have to know that our people are safe and are controlled. And I think that's one of the things about this that is very, very important. It's keeping in mind that no matter what, for every action you take, there is going to be a reaction to that. And you have to have thought it out or get permission so if something changes, it can be communicated back to the command post and they can reverse or redirect something else. Uh, Jack Murphy, uh, there was a fire that occurred uh, oh, maybe 10 years ago in Chicago in the Cook County office building. And uh, it, it, was, it was a real bad situation. And uh, there were some occupants that were trapped in the stairway, couldn't get back into their respective offices because of uh, uh, door locks. And uh, the Chicago Fire Department made some uh, significant changes in their high-rise procedures. Uh, and they learned some lessons, important lessons for us all, but um, would you comment, uh, Jack, on directing the success of directing people to a particular stairway? We designate an attack stairwell. Uh, how effective can we be in directing people to a different stairwell for evacuation? Yeah. Once, you had a, once you have a designated person in the building, say like a fire and life safety director, you know, prior to the arrival of the fire department, if you have an event on the floor, I'll direct them to a certain staircase. So if the fire is starting at the north end, I'll direct them to the south staircase. We label our staircases uh, alphabetically. We encourage people when we make our announcements to tag a name onto it, like Alpha, Beta, Delta, go to the Delta stair. With that, when the fire department comes in, I say I, I tell them ahead of time, I, I evacuate everybody in D and Delta. You can use any one of the other stairs for your attack stairs. The fire is on the north end. So, so we give them somewhat of a direction, like a heads up. So they come into our building with what we call situational awareness. You're not going to get that in every building. In some of the buildings, let's take the Chicago building, for example. Their policy was for that building to lock all stair tower doors. Once you went into the stair tower, you could not re-enter into any floor. And there was a law in place, and it came out of the MGM fire, that every four floors have to be re-entry floors in commercial buildings because people were trapped in the stairwell years ago, and Clark can, can mention that, the situation there. But across the country, we changed that. The other thing here in the Chicago building is that there was an old fire tower in that building. And the fire tower is, for the, for the audience, I come off the car, I open the door, I have an interstitial vestibule, and the smoke travels up what they call an open shaft well. Then I open the door to the staircase. What that is is that the smoke goes up, it shouldn't get into the stairwell. 
in that area, they with all the doors locked, it's, the people could not get back in. I'm not lock. I'm not one for locking any doors to get back in. Uh, and you'll get doors locked in, in high-rise office buildings, even hotels, high-rise office buildings when it's mixed occupancy. And again, you got to know your buildings. If it's a one occupancy, like any any major corporation, I can walk up and down stairwells all I want. So knowing buildings ahead of time and what's there, where the re-entry floors are is good. When you get into the residential building, guys, we all know it. All bets are off. They're coming down every stairwell. So when you have someone there to direct you, it's great. So these are the things we're looking at, like I alluded to before, on the hence the fire and life safety directors in more of these buildings. The Chicago building was unique. It was an old building. And when and I went in the building, I can't tell you what I was doing there for, for legal reasons. But when I went in the building, that interstitial area, the only way the loo was opened was a fusible link. And the only thing that could cause that to get in there, if someone chopped the door open on the car to the side, then the fusible link would go and went up. So it was relatively ineffective. If you think about it, the only, the only electric you had in there was, was a light bulb. It wasn't even a switch. So those louvers didn't open. It was old school. It was approved in the 50s or 60s, but that was the method there. So, again, I applaud everybody to get people in these buildings so when you get there, you at least have some situational awareness. A lot, it's a lot better than you guessing <laughs> a size of what floor this is coming from. Yeah, in order to fight a fire intelligently in any of these buildings, it, there has to be a lot of pre-fire planning. And part of that is a working relationship with the building management and security, fire marshals, if it happens to be that uh, type of building. Uh, we're at our halfway point. Again, I want to thank Key Fire Hose, keyfire.com, for sponsoring this hump day hangout. Very easy endorsement for me. It's because of what, it's what my company uses. Uh, we use their top of the line, the Key Combat Ready. Again, you're not going to find a, a, a more kink-resistant hose uh, on the market. And uh, I would encourage you that if you're uh, looking to replace hose, uh, purchase some hose for your department, uh, get some samples of Key Combat ready, and intentionally try to kink it. It's you're gonna it, it's going to be a challenge to you. So, Jason Hobelman, if I could, uh, same situation. Uh, you've got a fire uh, in a in a high-rise building or a low-rise building where you're using high-rise firefighting tactics. The door to the fire apartment or office is open, or somebody has pulled a burning couch or mattress out into the hallway and the doorway is closed, but the stairway, the hallway is dirty. In other words, you're not going to leave the, uh, the refuge of the, um, the fire-rated stairway, enclosed stairway, uh, without a charged hose line. How do you get the civilians out of that stairwell, particularly the ones above. But uh, Mike Dugan was talking about the the neutral pressure plane. Uh, in in my part of the world, we have to worry about the people below the fire because of the reverse or negative stack effect when the temperature in the building is lower than it would be outside. So that's a and you know you're having a bad day, fellas, when you have a fire on the sixth floor. And you open the door, and the smoke's on the first floor. Uh, this was a contributing factor to a line of duty death in Asheville, North Carolina, a few years ago. And uh, you, like I say, you know you're having a bad day. But if I, again, if I could pose that question to you, Jason, how do you control your people in that situation? We are in the process of figuring that out. We're lucky the buildings we have have dual stairwells. And kind of like what Jack talked about, the residential. And during the daytime, there's people on site to direct them to the proper stairwell but at nighttime or weekends all bets are off and what we've what we've kind of discussed doing in the, in the instance that because we perform drills there during the day when management's been on on site to help us uh, they let us flow water in the apartment I mean they let us do everything that we would do normally we still get occupants during a drill that come down the, the attack stairwell um, we did play around with pressurizing that stairwell. We don't we don't ventilate the bulkhead. Um, our primary mission was one to get an attack line to the fire as quickly as possible to start in, in improving the overall environment and to send multiple crews above to either protect in place if the floors above are tenable or to help guide some people down the stairs. Because once they're in the stairwell, you've got to go somewhere with them. Going up obviously is not optimal. 
So pressurizing the stairwell, we were able to do it with a conventional gas-powered uh, positive pressure fan uh, enough to where it did lift some of the, the, the fake smoke we had in there. Um, obviously, without having it on fire, we don't know exactly what it's going to do, but we feel like it gives a little bit of an option to push that all the way up to the very top um, and uh, to start clearing some of those floors above us or people coming off the fire floor while we're making the attack. But it's, it's going to be a cluster. We, we don't think there's going to be a real easy way to do it other than putting the fire out as quickly as possible while having a crew or two escorting people that are already in the stairwell along with seeing if we can protect in place a couple floors, three or four floors above. You know, if you, uh, it's been, a, it's, a, it's uh, for public consumption. It, it was produced by uh, uh, NIST. It's been out for years now. It was the, uh, the, the ventilation studies of a high-rise housing project building in Chicago uh, where they used uh, two fans, I believe, I could be wrong on this now, but two gasoline-powered fans at the uh, base of the stairway and then one um, in a V pattern. And, uh, and then one, I think one or two floors below the fire. And um, the uh, effects of the, uh, of the positive pressurization was, uh, was dramatic. It was, it was very impressive. Uh, now, to, to what extent would you lose that pressurization by having the bulkhead door open? Um, I don't know. But um, in this situation, I don't believe the bulkhead door was open. Uh, but uh, when they shut the fans off, uh, of course, you saw a reversal of the smoke back into the stairway. But um, everybody sh should be privy to this. Any firefighter that has any kind of a multi-story building in his uh, district, it should be old news, yesterday's news to any firefighter. Uh, they sh you should avail yourself to this. It's on the NIST website. Uh, you can get discs uh, from NIST. That's the National Institute for Standards and Training. It's a government agency, so it's uh, it's available uh, pretty much free of charge. Uh, Daryl, we want to comment on this dilemma where we have people, civilians, coming down the stairs with bird cages, flat screen TVs, chihuahuas, and small children, and you're jonesing to open up that door and go attack that fire, but you know as soon as you open the door, you're going to turn it into a chimney. Um. Yeah, well, I think if we open up the bulkhead door, we're really making it a chimney. If we think about a chimney, there's an opening at the top. And there's been a lot of talk about, um, uh, you know, smoke movement and wind-driven fires and uh, flow path is the popular name. There really isn't much of a flow path unless you have a reverse stack effect or unless the bulkhead door's open. So it's probably best to keep that closed and... Uh, the other thing is um, controlling people, and I know we can do a better job at this, not just in our city, but in a lot of cities. We you underutilize the uh, PA system in these residential buildings. We have to try to control people. We're not going to control them all, but by using this PA system and directing people towards a certain stairwell, that's going to be a tremendous uh, help. Uh, of course, we have, uh, especially in my city, a lot of people speaking many, many different languages, so it's not going to be something that we can uh, get this message to all occupants in all situations, but it, it'll be um, helpful. Uh, and that comes to fire drills. If we do some fire drills ahead of time in these buildings, especially where we know we're going to have language barriers, we can um, have those people know what to do in the event of fire. Um, when I was in the uh, city of New York, and Mike, you might be able to talk about this, I noticed that directing people towards a certain staircase seems like it may be easier there because I saw the stairwell designation on the occupant side of the door, where in our city you have to go into the stairwell and look at the sign to know which stairwell you're in. It seems like it'd be much better if you're in a hallway and you can look down and see that that's stairwell A, that's stairwell B, that's non-existent where I, where I am, but I think it would be a terrific idea for occupants to s clearly see the stairwell designation. Otherwise, how would they? Who's going to know what stairwell A is from the hallway? Um, we, but we, we do require that. You do require that. We do yeah, require right. that in buildings on both sides of the door, on the occupancy side, on the stair side. We require every floor to be labeled. What the floor is, what the stair letter is where you are. 
and then, as Jack said, four floors in a building to re-enter to an un unlocked door. So if you're on the seventh floor and the floors are the ninth and the fifth, it will tell you that you have to either go up to or down to to get to an unlocked door, unless the doors are fail-safe doors, which means they're all locked and on the um, activation of any automatic detecting device, all the doors unlock so the people can get through. And that's an automatic. That's not so people can try to rob the place and pull the, uh, it's got to be something automatically detecting it. It can't be just a pull station. Okay, so is that, those locked doors, is that usually a commercial building or is that on residential as well? Um, most times it's in commercial buildings. Most times it's in commercial buildings. It can be in some high-end residential, but um, we see it mainly because in the high-end residential, they have people controlling access to the building in the way of doormen, concierges, and everything else. So usually it's in commercial buildings. Yeah, so, so mainly those three things, I think just communicating with people, utilizing that PA system, you know, doing fire drills, and if, if uh, it could be implemented to have the stairwells labeled inside, I think that would be a tremendous benefit. But also weighing in back on the, um, the uh, opening of the bulkhead door, and we're talking about protecting people, uh, and we're some of the people in this building, we don't want to be the firefighters now in that draft, in the middle of that chimney, where... Uh, we will have, you know, if we do have smoke in the hallway, and we will at some point, um, understand that once we open that exhaust, we basically made a smoke-proof stairwell out of this, and we can find ourselves in downstream go fighting our way uphill. Yes, an area, an area of low pressure. Yeah, an area of low pressure. And we, uh, that, we get that ahead. in our occupants, on that, and especially the one building that we've had the most problems with, the, the occupant stairwell is pressurized on its own, so that's where we try to push everybody to. Even if we got to meet them in our stairwell, get them off the stairwell into the, another floor, we scoot them over to the pressurized stairwell. The one we operate in is not pressurized, and that's why we'll do it on our own if we need to. And, you know, that might be a good note to have near a, a, a PA system in the fire control room of, of, a, of some indication there of what is that pressurized stairwell, so whoever's given that announcement would know immediately where they may be directing people. And the other thing, gentlemen, on the pressurized stairwell, it's limited. It's limited to certain doors opening. I think it's five. If you go beyond that, you, you override the system. Pressure. It is limited. It is yeah. limited. The other thing, too, to look at, has anyone come across, and I was trying to text you and I couldn't get it out to the chat group, uh, has anyone seen automatic smoke hatches in stairwells? Another animal. You're in there, you don't take the bulkhead. Now you're charging your line down the hallway, but all of a sudden everything's pushing towards your way because the smoke detector at the top opened up the hatch. So I have, Mike, I have that in several high rises in, in New York. Mm -hmm. All right, one where, where I worked at the Presbyterian you know, Burn Center on mm -hmm. the 14th, 15th floor. They had, all, I had four stairwells that had automatic smoke hatches. I've right. seen a variation of that, Jack. Yeah. Uh, pre fire planning, a. a, a high-rise building before it received a certificate of occupancy. And I noticed that there's uh, louvers uh, at the top of the stairwell. And uh, I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is a pressurized stairwell. Uh, it has these powerful uh, centrifugal fans on the roof that pressurize the stairwell and the elevator shafts. Why would you have that smoke vent on the top where you're going to lose the pressure? And the, uh, the, the building engineer uh, explained to me that the pressurization is so great that this this um, this these, this vent at the top actually burps. It yeah. burps to relieve the pressure. Otherwise, uh, a little old lady would not have the strength to open up the stairwell door. Yeah, that's that's been a problem in several buildings. All right. The other thing too. Let, let's talk about stairwells again. Stay on that. And uh, one of the things at the 9/11, we adopted photoluminous markings within the stairwell. This is what I call a green room. We lose power in the building. Some buildings don't have generators. This illuminates in the building. Does anyone have that out there other than New York? We, we passed it, uh, and I, I think it's a godsend for everybody. You can see in total darkness coming down. I call it a green room. 
And when we put the standard together in New York, I served on that committee, uh, we said 24-hour illumination. All I need is what we call two candela of light. You can see every step. You can see the, 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 the uh, platform. You can see how the door swings. You can see where the standpipe is as an obstruction. And at the exit discharge, because I have some exits that discharge into the lobby, we go around the whole door mark because as you're coming downstairs, you lose count. That's the door we want you to go out. So it, I would advise those areas to take a look at this. If anyone needs information, I'll send it to them. And one of the things we did is when we put it together, because of the, the, uh, the, the length of it, we put pictures in saying this is how you do it, this is what you do. And with all the threats I'm dealing with here in the city, when you go out the exit discharge, it, it didn't go in as it went in as an uh, as a except, exception. What street am I going on? And give me the North Arrow indicator. I'm going out onto J Street. If I go left, it's north. Because there are other outside events, I got to move people away in a separate area. So take a look at it. I will send it to everybody on the committee. And uh, if you want, Bill, I'll tell you how to get it out to the, everybody else. And it's amazing, too, Jack, because they also, we now require it in the city of New York on the exit doors. And as uh, we were saying with Daryl, uh, just walking the staircase, we now require an exit sign within 18 inches of the floor, within six inches of the exit door on the floor. So if you're crawling in smoke, and it's got to be on the latch side so you can reach up and know where the handle is on that door. And that is such a smart thing because the exit sign, the old illuminating red exit sign, is already gone in smoke. So the photoluminescent exit path markings are one of the best things we came up with. They put that into effect in 2007, I think it was came into the law after 9/11. But it's it's brilliant. The the other thing too in residentials, and I'll throw this out for a group discussion. Mike, since you left, the new code says they have to have the the apartment number low too on the floor level. On the floor level, so we can crawl in right. and see the floor. Okay, you know, 16A, 16B, whatever it is, within uh, 18 inches of the floor. Again, well, that's a great idea. Uh, Dan Shaw, I'm going to pose a question to you, uh, Chief Dan. Uh, many high-rise buildings have smoke tower stairwells, which uh, Mike and uh, uh, Jack Murphy uh, alluded to earlier. Uh, where occupants fleeing a smoke-filled hallway enter either an open-air landing like I would see in South Florida, or an enclosed vestibule with a smoke shaft before entering a stairwell. Now, the, the intention there is, uh, the intent is, so the smoke doesn't follow you into the stairwell. A smoke tower may become an area of low pressure relative to the fire floor and draw fire towards firefighters advancing a hose line from it. Does your department permit the use of a smoke tower as an attack stairwell? Uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of uh, exposure to exactly that situation you have, Bill. And you know, I think, uh, again, it's, it's somewhat dependent on where you work. I mean, we're fortunate in where I work is I, I think – some of our success has come from uh, the infrastructure we have in place, uh, i.e. we have a, a high-rise manual that really clearly dictates what every position is going to be filled on the fire ground. So even though we have that reflex time, the units are getting in place pretty quickly. And we have the staffing. I mean, a, a single alarm for me is 44 people in just about six minutes, uh, where, you know, obviously that's automatic second alarm with a working fire, so you, you're almost doubling that pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, within those units, that infrastructure kind of helps with that is, uh, going back to what Jack was saying with the stairwell, our first engine responsibility is to identify the attack evacuation stairwell. That second truck's job is to confirm that that is still accurate. Uh, and then our fifth engine on every high-rise is lobby control. And the only thing they do is the movement of people in the lobby, and then a guy goes in the fire control room and has to be savvy enough to understand how to shut b certain building systems down and usually we get him to grab the building engineer who wants to do all good and yank him in the fire control room and keep him contained. And the code in Fairfax says there's particular things that have to be in the fire control room, uh, even with our older high rises. I mean, older high rises is a little difficult, but the minute they do a retrofit, they got to come up to the modern standard, and they got to have that fire control room with all the particulars in there that we demand within the code. And 
outside phone line for communications to building pre-plans, non-ambulatory people, and also having uh, that, you know, essentially making that fifth engine understand that they have the heart and the brain of the building, and they can kind of, one, confirm what the radio reports are saying about where smoke is and stack effect, but also uh, know how to control the building and make it do what we want to. Uh, in a perfect world, we give all our citizens a high-rise manual, and if they hear us say attack or evacuation stairwell, they assimilate and do what they're supposed to, but you know, that, that's not a reality. So back to what you know, Daryl was saying is one of the things we retrain on with our lobby control engine is quickly understanding how they can isolate that uh, radio or the uh, loudspeaker controls to particular floors to tell those people to evacuate, to tell the other people to protect in place. Uh, but one of the big things we really get is, uh, especially when that first engine arrives, and they make a declaration usually by looking at the floor below, figuring out where the fire apartment is in closest proximity to where that uh, stairwell is, uh, the riser they're going to use, is they have to, you know, each one of those four guys on that engine have an assignment for how they hook that line up. But that company officer's job really is to, as soon as he walks the lower floor, tells the guys humping the hose, hey, it's going to be the fifth apartment down the left that we'll hook up the next riser. He continues up the next flight and makes sure that we don't have any fleeing occupants coming down. Uh, and so on a high-rise fire for us, you're going to get the first engine, the second engine, the first truck, and the first rescue company all on the fire floor. And, you know, part of the reason we did that was we understood that the importance of getting water on the fire was paramount, but also you're not going to need all those people to stretch a hose line and probably conduct a, a primary search in that fire apartment. So you can use one of those other companies, rescue company, to start going to the upper floor, pushing people across the uh, common hallway to another stairwell and down. Uh, but we, I think we, you know, we all learned it's, it's very time intensive and uh, staffing intensive to really get the people to migrate to where you want them to go because they, they don't have our manuals. They don't know that you just said that was the evacuation stairwell, the attack stairwell. So it, it takes, uh, even though we have that reflex time to get there, uh, it's almost like Andy Fredericks always said, you have to have a, a deliberate, patient, professional engine company. you got to be deliberate, patient, professional what you're going to do and understand that as bad as you want to go fight fire, your job is to protect lives, and you're going to protect more lives by making sure you have the fire in check and then also the occupants are not in that uh, chimney you're about to create. Clark, uh, I'm going to pose the same question to you. Uh, I know that you have buildings with smoke towers because uh, when I was there recently, I went to take some pictures of standpipes and the smoke tower, and I was in one of your uh, high-rise hotels, and I looked at my watch. It was 9 o'clock at night, and I looked at my watch, and I'm asking myself, how long will it take security to come get me and ask me what am I doing? It took less than two minutes, Clark. What is this guy doing taking pictures of the fire protection system and the stairways? And, of course, he understood, but uh, it does go to show you that uh, the security in those buildings is quite tight. But uh, were you clothed, Bill? Yes, I was clothed. At least, yes, I was clothed. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what kind of clothes I was wearing you know, at the time. You, you, beat up, you bring up a good point. Yes. Work with your security cameras in these buildings. If they're not at the fire command center, work with security. You can get them up running quick and get a real situation awareness on the floor. So I love cameras all over the place. That's Jack, you mentioned that. That's exactly how we operate in Clark County. First rescue on scene goes to the fire control room. And some of these new buildings, the fire control rooms, and I'm sure you've seen in all your travels around the world, these fire control rooms are so up to date so technolo technologically advanced that I could tell you a number of sprinklers that's been activated. Each of our sprinklers is activated. Each of our smoke detectors is activated. And if uh, I have security tell me, hey, I've got smoke detectors on the 14th floor, my next question is, all right, let me see the cameras on the 14th floor. They bring it up. Boom. I report to command. At command, we have smoke. I have visual confirmation that we do have smoke on the 14th, 15th, 16th floor. Those cameras are extremely valuable. And in Las Vegas, if you guys ever come to Las Vegas and you think you're going to be screwing around or something, taking pictures naked in a hallway like Captain Gustin, um, every single square foot of common space in a Las Vegas casino is under video surveillance. Every single square foot of strip, anything on the Las Vegas Boulevard, every single square foot is covered by video surveillance. It's tough to get anything done secretively in Las Vegas. 
Well, you wouldn't have been able to recognize me in the stairway because I had a long blonde wig on. So, um, but I got to tell you, I'm never. I don't know how women do it. Wear those high heels because it, <laughs> I ended up getting bunions, and I was only wearing those high heels for just a few minutes. But you know what goes on in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Hey, we're just about ready to wrap things up. Uh, some of the things that these comments that you guys are sending me. Oh man. Um, and that'll stay amongst us. But uh, if we could just close things out, I want to start with Jack. Thank you so much, Jack. I you you I know you weren't going to disappoint us. You filled everybody's expectation. You brought so much to the table. We want to have you back. You are truly blessed to have this uh, level of experience and background, Jack Murphy. So, any closing thoughts, sir? No, just it's just a matter of sharing, you know. And again, Mike knows. It. You know, I, I came across the river from Jersey, and you get thrown in the fire real quick in New York. Either you learn it or you get the hell out. And the idea there is all the th years I've been there, I keep learning every day. And my attitude in dealing with the magazine or FDIC is pass it on. My father left the job in 30, 36 years. I said, Dad, what do I do? You figure it out. All right? That's changed. We need to pass everything on. And the, one of the things, and you know my forte, is building intelligence. We can't keep doing this stuff under our helmet. When you leave, I know nothing about the building for the next crew. So get a legacy out there. Very good. Mike Dugan, any closing thoughts? Well, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, Jack hit on it so well, is identify your buildings, what the problems are. And we started talking about EFIS and the exterior fires. You have to have a plan. If it's an exterior fire, it starts on a deck space, starts in outdoor furniture or something, how you are going to get water on that fire. This is one of the ones where I think hitting it hard from the yard might be in, uh, a great option. Having an idea of how you're going to get water on the exterior of the building. Whether you're going to go up to the top floor and use the stamp pipe and open up and start wetting the exterior of the building, but have a plan in your buildings that you know what you're going to do with. Because, again, the interior sprinklers are going to work on this building. It's going to be getting water on where the fire is and what is going to be the most judicial and how are you going to be able to expedite it as quickly as possible. I want to thank you all again. It has been, been a pleasure, as always. Hey, Jason, any, thank you, Mike. Uh, Jason, any closing thoughts? No, to kind of dovetail on what Captain Dugan says, we're seeing a lot of that, that foam stuff on the smaller buildings, the newer fast food restaurants and the, the hotels that are remodeling with the cornices like uh, like Clark was talking about. So don't think it's just to the, the high-rise buildings that are putting these things on. They're, they're probably in your backyard like someone said earlier. And and uh, in our in our case, a lot of these buildings are pretty close together. So we've got, uh, we consider it as an extra exposure hazard. But thanks again for a great day and uh, looking forward to next month. Great. Daryl, any closing thoughts, sir? Yeah, um, one thing with... Uh, High rise firefighting is uh, don't treat residential and commercial fires as the same animal. They could be quite different animals. We know commercial fires could have a much greater fire load than most of our residential, and our residential fires could have uh, a, a very high life hazard, you know, at nighttime. Um, if you are a department that isn't prepared for a large fire in a high rise. Um, and you're having success with your inch and three-quarter lines and your residential tactics, uh, think different because it, it can and will happen at some point in time. Um, Jack, it was nice to meet you. The rest of you guys are familiar faces, but very nice to meet you. And as far as that last question we were talking about as far as uh, smoke-proof towers, I think we have a practical problem with most firefighters, including myself, even recognizing when we have a smoke-proof tower. Of course, you know if the staircase is outside, but maybe that needs to be one of the next articles here in fire engineering is recognizing if you have a smoke-proof uh, uh, tower. So that first uh, engine officer recognizes if that's what exists, and that's where they choose to not stretch their first hose line. Well, Daryl, anyway. I, want, I want you to write the article, send it to me so I can put my name on it, <laughs> submit it to fire engineering because I am one plagiarizing bastard. That's how I do it. <laughs> Any closing thoughts, uh, Chief Dan Shaw? Yes, uh, you know, another great conversation, and I think what we've learned through history, uh, through our own experiences and what we've written, the, 
read in a line of duty deaths and close calls and significant fires is that uh, the high rise fire is the chess match of firefighting. I mean, that's you got your reflex time, and it's such a build up of strategy and tactics and so many variables in there. And, and the key to that is we want thinking firefighters. And much like what Jack just said, one of the things we share in all our classes is something we stole from the Marine Corps is that the Marine Corps have this thing called the 5,000 year mine, which is based upon. In fact, there's 5,000 years of documented warfare in the book. So every day a Marine should be in the books reading about past success and failures and applying that to today, regardless of what rank they are. Well, we in the firefighting uh, history, we have 2,000 years of history. So you know, really every day we should be building that 2,000-year mind, taking away from past experiences, tapping resources like Jack and you and Mike and the rest of the guys in this panel, and using that and applying it to our modern day environment because as Jack said, I mean your, your time in the fire service is about creating that legacy uh, because the sun's not gonna, you know, some people think the sun's not gonna rise the day you retire. Fire service is gonna keep on rolling so you might as well leave a legacy of really building that thinking pragmatic firefighter. But another great conversation, look forward to next month and hope you guys are all well. Clark, any closing thoughts, sir? Uh, it was a pleasure again as always working and uh, discussing these issues with like-minded individuals. Um, thank you, Jack, for showing up. Chief Murphy, we appreciate you coming. And uh, I do have a, several pictures of these foam systems, several pictures of the Monte Carlo fire, and some video of the Monte Carlo fire. Uh, it looks like we're going to post those on the Fire Engineering website as a link to this chat. So, um, And I, I challenge our listeners out there, think about, do you have these systems in your first in or in your community? And then take a look at the pictures I'm going to post, and I, I almost guarantee you you're going to say, oh, is that what we're talking about? Absolutely. Right down the street at the jack-in-the-box has that system on it. The Lowe's has that system on it. You're going to be surprised once you start driving around, and you can identify these systems, how much of it is in your first in, because it's cheap and it's easy to do. And we all know that contractors, building designers, that, that's their two favorite words, cheap and easy. So they are using this in your, in your jurisdiction, I can almost guarantee it. Thank you again, everybody, and I'll see you next month. Yes. All right, I want to give another shout-out, sincere thanks to uh, Key. Uh, I use their Combat Ready hose. It's the best hose on the market as far as I'm concerned. In my experience, again, try a sample of it. See if you can kink it. It's very difficult to kink. It's got the best balance of uh, durability, kink resistance. It's got remarkable flow capability. So uh, if you're considering new hose, consider key hose. So brothers and sisters from uh, USA, Canada, and around the world that are watching, thanks so much for taking your time to participate with us. And uh, we're going to see you next week. It will be the second Wednesday of every month. So until then, God bless you. May he keep you safe in our most noble and proud profession.